Okay, so let's think about this. Beginning of the year, we started with the chemistry of... You don't remember. The chemistry of water. Very good. Then, the second nine weeks, we talked about the chemistry of stuff, materials. Okay? And then the third nine weeks, we covered kind of two different chemistry ofs. The chemistry of the atom, right? We talked about nuclear chemistry. And then the chemistry of energy. How about carbon? We talked about organic chemistry, combustion, calorimetry. Now we turn our attention to something that's been very relevant in your lifetime, the atmosphere. Why has it been relevant in your lifetime? Yes, yes. I mean, ever since you were a little kid, you have been uh, the fear of global warming, or what they're now calling climate change, has been bred into you. And you've heard shows and and uh, uh, every TV programs and news and teachers all mention this. Okay, so we're going to touch upon this as we cover the chemistry of the atmosphere. All right. So, where is the Earth's atmosphere located? It's located about 10 to 12 kilometers above the Earth's surface. I mean, that is just amazing to me. 10 to 12 kilometers. That's like from here to the end of Knoxville. That's how thick the Earth's atmosphere is. And we are so dependent on it. This region is called, maybe from middle school, you remember, troposphere. The troposphere. Why is the atmosphere's chemical composition relatively uniform? What governs that? Does anyone remember from middle school? Okay, what pretty much governs every aspect? Water. Water? Carbon. No. Carbon? Oxygen. No. Oxygen? No. Carbon How about the sun the sun okay the sun unevenly heats everything I mean right now we're warming the sun is warming us up and it's cooling down on the other side of the planet that makes air move around that makes air move around anytime you feel wind what's going on is that air is moving from hotter areas to cooler areas that's wind, folks. That's it. So because air is constantly moving around, it's mixing up. So that we get, pretty much with every breath we take, we get this much. I think Sting wrote a letter, uh, a song about this. Every breath we take, every move you make, that's referring to the atmosphere. Yes, yes. He's watching you through the atmosphere. Okay, remember... Take a breath in. What are you breathing mostly? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Take a breath out. What are you breathing out mostly? Nitrogen. You're still in middle school mode. No. You breathe in mostly nitrogen. You breathe out mostly nitrogen. About 80%. Now, the pudding's in the 20% that's left over. Okay? That's where the action is. Nitrogen doesn't do much for us. When you breathe in, you're breathing in about how much percentage? 21% oxygen. When you breathe out, you're breathing out about 17% oxygen. When you breathe in, you're breathing in about much less than 1% carbon dioxide. When you breathe out, you're breathing out about four to five percent carbon dioxide folks that's why cpr works think about it you die from carbon dioxide poisoning so if you are breathing in oxygen then when you go to breathe into somebody's lungs if you're breathing out carbon dioxide are you going to resuscitate them no you're going to encourage them to die okay no when you breathe in, you're breathing in mostly nitrogen and oxygen. When you breathe out, you're breathing out still mostly nitrogen and oxygen. 
okay? A little more carbon dioxide, but still mostly oxygen. So you can resuscitate somebody with your breathing out. Now, if you were to seal up this room, prevent any air from coming in, what's going to happen to us eventually? Because we will use up not all, but a lot of the oxygen, and we will replace it with carbon dioxide. Okay? Notice there's some trace amounts of everything else, but pretty much oxygen and carbon dioxide is what's going to change over time. In the morning, of course, we do produce a little more methane. What's methane? Natural gas. Our bodies produce it. In addition to these gases, what else will the atmosphere contain? Trace, trace amounts of hydrogen and xenon. Those are okay, but ozone, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, and sulfur dioxides are deadly. All right, that was our introduction. Okay, this is the meat. Targets for today. I can explain Avogadro's law. And number two, I can explain what STP means and give its numerical value. Okay? What if we were to place three balloons of one mole of oxygen, nitrogen, and argon gas? Three very different gases. What would we observe? These gas laws, the, these observations, is what led us to the gas laws. And these gas laws govern everything. It explains how you can breathe. It explains how you can pass gas. Okay? It explains the internal combustion engine. It explains how you can get the bends. It explains hot air balloons. Shoot, it explains inflating a balloon. It explains why we as a country did awful in the 1968 Summer Olympics. It explains why the two longest field goals in NFL history were kicked in what stadium? Anybody know? What is it, the stadium in Denver? Mile High Stadium. Why? Why is it that now that baseball has started, we can pretty much expect that Coors Field in Denver is going to have the most home runs? Why? They will all have the same volume. If you doubled the pressure outside the balloon, their volume would shrink to half the volume. If you increase the temperature, the balloons would expand. The balloons would shrink if you removed some of their gas. That pretty much encapsulates Avogadro's law, Charles' law, Boyle's law, and my favorite and yours, Gay Lussac's Law. That was his name. It has nothing to do with his sexual preference. Okay, he was a French guy. What is Avogadro's Law? Two gases at the same temperature and pressure will be exerting the same volume if they have the same amount. I just inflated this balloon with human air, okay? I put a certain amount of air. If I was to put the same amount of xenon gas, what would we find according to Avogadro's law? The same volume, that's right, same volume. What if we were to use the same amount of poisonous carbon monoxide gas? How big would this balloon be? 
But they're different gases, Mr. Moreno. Yes, it doesn't matter. But they're different masses. Yes, they will weigh differently. But they'll have the same volume. See, once things get to be gases, it really doesn't matter what they are. They all act the same. What is STP? This is an acronym that we're going to use very often. STP refers to keeping the conditions the same. Standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature and pressure. 273 degrees Kelvin and one atmosphere. 273 Kelvin and one atmosphere. Avogadro did not come up with this number, but his research, actually most of his research was done with gases. That's what eventually led on to Avogadro's, remember even Avogadro's number is not something he came up with. He is largely responsible for showing us that it doesn't matter what gas you're dealing with, they are all going to act the same. So this number that we later came up with is a number that is based on his research. He was a brilliant, cantankerous sucker, mean as a snake, but he was brilliant. All right, this is basically his idea graphically shown. Okay, as you're adding molecules, what is happening to the size of the balloon, Spencer? Okay, tell me about in terms of its volume. The volume is staying the same? The volume is increasing. Okay, that could be xenon, that could be krypton, that could be carbon dioxide, that could be oxygen. Those little bubbles, they just represent gases. It doesn't matter what the gas is. It could be all of them. And they're always going to exert the same pressure. Therefore, the volume will be the same. Now, that's a needle up there. Now, normally you have seen this happen in an instant. It's going to slow it down for you. Because, I mean, believe it or not, those molecules have been slowed down. Uh, what's happening to the volume? Okay, so who can explain Avogadro's law for us? Raise your hand. You think you got a grip on Avogadro's law? Go ahead. Okay, okay first of all, what did you do to the temperature? Is there a temperature oh, change God. here? No. Okay, so if temperature is kept constant, what about the air pressure outside? Do you think the air pressure outside was changed in any way? If pressure and temperature remains the same, go. Uh, wait, yes. Uh, okay, um, I don't know. okay, how about if you quote it like this? What happens to the volume as you do what? To the number of molecules. The volume of the increases. As increase or decrease the number of molecules. Increase. increase the number of molecules. Okay, what's the reverse? If you decrease, wait, the, size, the, the volume of the balloon decreases the number of molecules. Excellent. Avogadro's law. If you keep pressure and temperature the same, as you increase the number of molecules, you will increase the volume. As you decrease the number of molecules, you will decrease the volume. So, what would happen if you were to dive from the ocean surface downward? Come on, you're at the pool and you start swimming down to the bottom of the pool. What do you feel? Okay, your ears, you begin to feel it in your ears. There's pressure. We 
pressure. What does that mean, pressure? The diver would begin to experience greater and greater water pressure. The fact is, we're used to the ocean, but the atmosphere is the same way. You can think of the atmosphere as an ocean of air. So, if the atmosphere was like an ocean, I guess what would we be like in the ocean? Not just the fish, but what kind of fish? Whales. Whales can go deep, but not too deep. Whales would be like birds up in the air. What would we be? The sea cucumbers, those crazy looking sea creatures down in the bottom, right? The angler fish. Yes, we're those freaky, ugly creatures that live down at the bottom of the air. The birds are the beautiful birds. They're like the fish that live on near the surface. So we're the ones who live down where the pressure is great. Most of the Earth's atmosphere can be found within what distance from the surface? About 12 kilometers. The atmosphere, what is the atmosphere like above the 12 kilometers? Well, before, who's ever gone on an airplane ride? Anybody? So some people have not. Okay, so the first little bit, what's it like? Bumpy, right? They call it what? Turbulence. Turbulence. Very good. And then they get above the 12 kilometers. And then what is it like? Calm. Oh. Calm, oh, yeah. So, above 12 kilometers, they better have the cabin pressurized or else you're in big trouble, right? Because the amount of oxygen and nitrogen goes down, the amount of poisonous gas go up, okay? What is it between 50 and 85 kilometers? We're talking spaceship place, you know, spaceship, high, high altitude airplanes. There's very few gases up there. Let's, Let's talk, talk about, about air pressure. pressure. What, what is air pressure? pressure? To, to learn about air pressure, pressure we must first define what pressure is. Pressure is the effect which occurs when a force is applied to a surface. P equals F divided by A. The force of air is caused by particles in the air being pulled toward the center of the earth by gravity. Since air is made of stuff, it has mass and weight. Therefore, it creates a pressure due to gravity pulling the stuff toward the center of the Earth. Picture a clear plastic tube going from a spot on Earth to 600 miles above sea level. That is where the atmosphere ends. In other words, there is no more stuff. Now let's fill the tube with eggs. The eggs at the bottom of the tube will have greater pressure on them, causing them to break and become more dense as the eggs now fill all the space in the bottom of the tube. The eggs near the top of the tube have less pressure on them because there are fewer eggs above them. With that picture in mind, you should be able to get an idea of air pressure. The farther from Earth's center you stand, as on Mount Everest, the fewer eggs above you and the less pressure. The closer to the center of the Earth, as in the Sea of Galilee, the more, the more eggs, eggs above you and the greater the pressure. We, we can, can measure, measure the air pressure using different instruments. instruments. We, we have manometers and barometers. The barometers can be mercury barometers or aneroid barometers. An altimeter is basically an aneroid barometer. One of the most one of the most interesting places in the United States at sea level is Key West, Florida. The elevation of Key West is sea level to a whopping 18 feet on top of Solaris Hill. 
Air pressure on a standard day in Key West is measured at 29.92 inches of mercury, or 760 millimeters of mercury, or 1013.25 millivolts. On top of Mount Everest in the Himalayan mountains, the altitude is 29,028 feet. That is about five and a half miles high. The air pressure is so low that people who climb Everest usually need to have extra oxygen with them. Woo, I could use that myself. Once again, you have a lower pressure than at sea level because there are fewer air particles above. The highest point in the state of Georgia is a mountain peak called Brass Town Mole. The elevation is 4,784 feet. Remember, you have a lower pressure than sea level because there are fewer air particles above. Reducing our altitude below sea level, we travel to the Salton Sea in California. The altitude is 220 feet below sea level. And since we are below sea level, we have more particles of air stacked above us, hence greater pressure. More stuff means more weight and greater force. Finally, we are at Lake Kinneret, the Sea of Galilee in Israel. Lake Kinneret is the lowest freshwater lake on Earth and located in the Great Rift Valley. The elevation of the lake is 696 feet below sea level. Because there is more stuff above us, like in the Salton Sea, the pressure is greater. Now that we know the elevations of these locations, use the air pressure versus altitude chart to determine the approximate air pressure on a standard day for each location. Target number four, I can explain the concept of atmospheric pressure. So yesterday we saw the video that helped us understand atmospheric pressure. Actually, that pretty much explains many, many of the questions that we started out with yesterday. But let's get this content first. What is pressure? The push that something has on another thing over a given area. The push that something has over another thing over a given area. The push that something has over a given area. This book has mass. Anything that has mass can push you. Okay, yes, particles have a little bit of mass, so their push is just a little bitty push. But this book has some mass to it, so it can push you. Here's my question. I'm going to use Emmy as an example. At which point here does the book have a greater push, or is it possible that the book has the same push? I'm going to put it flat on her head. Or B, I'm going to put it on her head, on her, on the edge. Okay, which one does it have a greater push? The edge. Any other possibility? I'm going to say flat. Flat. Any other possibility? Both. The answer is both. Why? What is push dependent on? Mass. Did the mass change? from here to here. Now what you guys were talking about was pressure. What happens to the push 
when I spread out the push over her entire head. Right. You feel it? How much of a push is there there? Okay. How about now that I take the push and, and spread it out over a tiny little area? Which one is it pushing harder? That one. <laughs> She's trying her best not to slap me and push the book away. Okay? Yes. The push is greater when it's over a small area. Here's another example. Imagine Ben at the pool here across the street. Ben goes up to the big trampoline. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry, the big diving board. The big diving board. Okay? So he jumps and spreads his push as far as it can go and lands by a spread push position. AKA belly flop. Yes, AKA belly flop. Is he going to feel it? I'm probably going to die. I'm probably going to die. Okay? Or what he can do is he can take the same push because he'll weigh the same. Take the same push and go straight down. I mean, perfectly Olympic style, straight down. What's he going to, which way is he going to exert the greatest pressure on the water? The belly flop. Wait, hold on, I'm confused. Whoa. Both? Olympic. Why? Because his force is the same. He spread the force, his force so far that water was able to push back a little bit. Remember surface tension, water sticks to itself. So water is able to withstand the pressure. Remember, pressure is force over area. Because he spread it out over a large area, he was able to, the water is able to withstand and fight back. But what happens if he takes all that force and puts it in a teeny tiny little area? What's the pressure on water like there? Very, very great. Just like the pressure on Emmy's head was very great when I put all of that force in one tiny little area. Okay? At that point, water can't fight you. It must submit. All right, here's another one. Both of these shoes weigh the same, ladies. Which one would you use on a young man's crotch if he tries to be fresh with you? Okay, which heel? The high heel. Why? They weigh the same. They can apply the same push. But with the high heel, you're putting all of that push in a tiny little area. So this can exert the greatest pressure. In what ways are pressure measured in? Atmospheres and kilopascals. Atmospheres and kilopascals. The instrument that we use to measure pressure is called the... Meteorologists talk about it all the time. Barometer. 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 All right. Speaking of meteorologists. Every night here on Fox 9 on your side, we like to take a closer look at the weather. Yes, we do. And maybe learn a few things while we're at it uh, from kids, even. Exactly, Scott. That's right. So, yeah, elementary school was school this week that I went to with a great group of kids here. We learned all kinds of things about what the kids were interested in. And uh, some great questions have come in. Here's one question that we have not had yet this year. My name is Monet, and I go to Siena Elementary, and my question is, what is a thermometer? What is a barometer? Excellent question there. And it's a weather instrument that's used to measure air pressure. And we talked a lot about a barometer. It made a homemade barometer in class. I would have brought it with me, but I've been making them all for the school, so I don't have any here anymore. <laughs> but I will tell you, the barometer that you may have in your house right now is called an aneroid barometer, and a barometer measures air pressure. So if you see something like this on your wall, it's usually with another 
couple of dials. One of them is a, a thermometer measuring temperature, and one of them is a high barometer measuring the amount of moisture in the air. This is a barometer, and so this is a pretty standard one. You'll see the black needle right here, and you'll notice these numbers on all of them, 28, 29, 30, and 31. So if you've seen a barometer like this and you wonder what they're talking about here, the reading for this would be 29, let's see, is 29 is 29.5, so 29.12, 29.24 is about what this reading is right here. That's a pretty low pressure right here, and so there may be a storm nearby. Lower pressure means a storm is approaching. Higher pressure means that it is generally fair weather. And that's why you'll see here rain, changing weather here, and fair weather uh, there. So this is an aneroid barometer. There's some other barometers around as well. This is an aneroid as well. And it shows, again, atmospheric pressure. The atmosphere has weight. Air has weight. 14.7 pounds per square inch is on top of us, is coming down on top of us all the time. And that weight of the atmosphere pushes down on this little cell here. As it squeezes it, it causes this needle to go up. So it'll be higher pressure here and lower pressure. Now, a standard barometer, the way they were first invented back in 1643, is done with mercury. It's hard to find right now. But what happens is, is the weight of the atmosphere pushes down on a pool of mercury here and is sent up to this tube. And the weight of the atmosphere, because of how strong, uh, how heavy the atmosphere is, it would force the column of mercury to rise 29.92 inches. So when you saw that number on the aneroid barometer, it's actually saying how high a column of mercury would climb up through a tube of glass here. And so as it goes up and down, the pressure would change. So this is not as a easy of a, an instrument to be carrying around. So the aneroid barometer is a lot more standard used now. But again, you have to adjust this for different elevations. Our pressure is lower because there's less atmosphere above us than if we were living down along the ocean. And so all barometric pressure readings are adjusted to sea level so that everybody's on the same playing field. So pressure is real interesting, but the kids grasped it very well at Siena Elementary. So big hello to all the kids there. Uh, and Pressure's a tough one. You know, you know why? Because you don't see it. You can't see the air. It's right? really hard to understand. Well, Scott, I was just thinking about some people say they can feel a storm coming because they feel it in their bones. I mean, is there anything to kind of that wise statement of, you know, feeling the pressure or something? Oh, absolutely. It's more in the joints, okay, oh, okay. because it has, it has to do with pressure and the rapid change in pressure, up or down, and the amount of moisture in the air as well. A lot of times it's the pressure, the rapid changing pressure, they, your, your joints are expanding, so they're causing a little bit of extra pain in there. Uh, so that's, yes, there's, there's absolutely. truth to that. There you go. There's definitely truth to that. All right, <laughs> thanks, thanks God. God. Well, what's the point of doing it? All right. So, how does a barometer work? The air is pushing down the air is pushing down on this mercury. There's only one place for it to go, and that's up here. This is nothing. It's vacuum. So that's there's nothing going to be pushing it down here. There's nothing. And yet, it doesn't go all the way to the top. Why? If something's not moving, then something's working against it. What could possibly be working against that column right there? Gravity. Mercury has weight. Anything that has weight will be pulled down by the gravity. So this point right here is the point where the force of air pushing it up equals the force of gravity pulling it down. Sometimes air wins, so it starts to go up. When that happens, that's good. That means that we have good weather coming up. Sometimes air weakens and gravity starts pulling down, and that's bad because that means we're going to have bad weather. All right? Um, if you ever see a barometer go down rapidly, then you need to get a little anxious because that would be indication of tornado. Yes, hurricane as well, but rapid would be tornado for most of us. When was the first experience with barometers first performed? 17th century by Avogadro student Evangelista Torricelli. How high was his column of water? It was three stories high. What? He should not have used water. Where a mercury barometer is only going to move up and down by inches, water, because it's 13 times less dense, is going to move up by feet feet 
Why did mercury eventually replace water barometers? Because mercury doesn't move up and down that much. It's a whole lot more dense. Three stories, so did he have it on the side of a building? <laughs> so, before we go on, let's go through the different numerical values for standard pressure. That's 101.3 kilopascals, one atmosphere, 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's the same thing as PSI, and that is what is used for tire pressure. 760 millimeters of mercury or TORS, and TORS is named after the guy who invented barometers, Torricelli. Okay. 